Welcome back everyone to the Captain's Council. This is session number three and today we are going to talk about culture and the power that culture has to get us to the goals that we aim for and also crucial conversations in the storming process as it relates to Bruce Tuckman's theory of team development. And to start as usual, what I'd like to do is for you all uh, to pause and think about what's been going on within the team the last uh, couple of weeks in uh, session two. And then also to think about and write down what you see your strengths are as a leader and what you see your weaknesses as a leader. Once you've completed that, uh, go over and think through session number two and just do a quick review. Um, the first one's actually from session one, which was an overview on your roles and responsibilities. The second are, um, the second question is what, what are the six tenets of leadership? And uh, I think that's an important one to remember because it's a great framework to help you uh, be more decisive and uh, acts as a blueprint as you come across different situations um, in your leadership position. And the final one is to discuss how you feel that you best influence the team. And once you've completed that, I'd like to start going through uh, the captain's guide to team culture. And to start, I think it just uh, is important to think about what culture is. And culture is about shared assumptions that guide and define appropriate behavior uh, for different situations that are occurring within your program. Um, culture initially comes from the Latin word that means uh, cultivate essentially. Uh, we see it in things like agriculture and, and horticulture. And the idea there and why I, I mentioned those two is because within for both the, for both of those words, what we're doing is trying to, uh, especially in agriculture, take the material world or the ground and those and the things that are within, you know, the ground, the raw material, so to speak. And uh, we cultivate it in order to provide something of value to us um, and express and ultimately in some other ways, uh, an example is to express meaning that we feel is important or value. And ultimately, something that James Hunter talks about is that um, since these things, uh, culture stems from the things that we believe, they drive the things that we value, and ultimately those two things um, uh, help us and are the reason for the behaviors and all of the things that we create. And because of that, it ultimately has the power to define reality and everything that we see in the world that we live in, which I think is really interesting and important as we think about um, you know, how our reality also uh, is the games that we win and the successes that we have. And I just mentioned those three elements there, but at the fundamental level, uh, at the bottom here are these underlying assumptions that we have about life. Um, and to get to those, you have to ask really hard questions. And sometimes you can pinpoint underlying assumptions when you ask a question and somebody says, well, of course that's the case. That's an assumption or a, a, a primal belief, so to speak, that ultimately will um, drive the values that we have, and uh, which are essentially these principles of behavior. And one of the things I think is important, I'll mention now and we'll um, talk about again here soon, is the idea that our values are something that should be so important to us that it is actually that that we would be willing to give up a win to uphold that value. And so your value and a good test to see if it is a value is that if you'd be willing to lose a game to uphold that value, that's how important these are to us. And ultimately, if you lose one game over it, it is what it is, but the idea and premise is that if we if we have strong values and we stick to those and we're all in alignment with those, that over time, um, we will be more consistent in our successes in our process. And then ultimately those things, underlying assumptions and values, which are the bottom of the iceberg, so to speak, drive these observable artifacts. Um, and again, these are all the things that we see from the behaviors that are enacted within the team, the way that the team 
uh, communicates together, the type of structures and buildings that are created, the language that is used, all of those are con considered and deemed uh, artifacts within culture. And so at this point in time, I want you to take some time and reflect. And on one, uh, if you can pull out a piece of paper, or just talk through these. Um, you, I want you on the left side to think about what are your personal values and write down what those are. You should be, you should have four to five that you really uh, feel strongly about. Um, a couple that I'll just share that are mine. Uh, the first is extreme ownership. Uh, and the second is commitment. And the third, and I have a couple others, but just to give you some examples, is uh, selfless service um, would be three that I feel like uh, are really valuable and things that I care about. And, um, and that helps us to focus on some specific things, but you want to have clarity on what those are. And so this reflection process will help with that. And then on the second, the second side of, or the right side of your paper, on the second exercise is discuss what your team's culture is. What are the values that you all are all committing to as a team? If you don't have assigned values, figure out what they should be, talk to your group and figure out, you know, uh, what those three are. Maybe you can, uh, your personal values should help drive what the team's values should be. Um, and if you do have values already uh, put in place that you have clarity on, that you've communicated to the team, then think about um, how are you measuring your culture in general? How are you measuring if your team is, uh, is enacting those values and have started to live those out? And I think that one of the best ways to do that is to, um, is to align a, a particular behavior, two, three, four behaviors that align with that value. And then think about if those behaviors are performed within the program frequently or not. And that might be a good uh, measure of success, so to speak, to see if your team's culture is what it is. So pause uh, now and go ahead and go through those two exercises. And so when we look at about uh, the captain's guide to this idea of culture, really your main job as the team captain is to model the way and then ultimately hold people accountable to the behaviors and the values that are really driven from the values, um, that is what your culture is. Um, and to encourage them as well, um, most of the times it's gonna require crucial conversations. Um, and that, that actually has a, a, uh, a higher level of effect, but that's not what you wanna do every single time. Sometimes you just need to come along with somebody and just encourage them and realize that um, you know, they're all, everybody's going through their own journey and so your, your goal is to hold them accountable, to push them, and you're just going to have to balance that with also just encouraging them throughout their journey again. And uh, I think it's important that you get comfortable with being uncomfortable because your culture ultimately is what you allow within your program. And uh, that should be something, if you take away anything, that is the one statement I would take away is that if you pass over a certain behavior, let's say there's uh, gossiping happening within your team and you hear that, you walk past it, you don't say anything, then gossip is an allowable behavior within your program. Uh, and that is a part of your culture. Uh, if it's bullying, that's the same thing. If, it is, um, if it's cutting corners and you don't say anything, that's a part of your culture. And all of the smallest behaviors matter when you're trying to develop a competitive advantage. And we mentioned this in session two, um, this is the six sources of framework and I kind of uh, will just hit on this again. And um, you know, as the team captain, uh, you're really, your, your role is here in the social sphere is to leverage your influence, your knowledge and insights and relationships with everybody and, um, and do what you need to do to get them to enact the right process and behaviors. And the next piece that we want to talk about here is storming. And so when we think about having to hold people accountable, that usually is a crucial conversation that is very uncomfortable, that can go very poorly many times. And so how do you go about this um, process, really? And so to start here, uh, I want you to, to pause and think about these, uh, these questions that I have here. 
and just reflect on that. The next part is Tuckman's theory. Uh, and uh, I think it was Bruce Tuckman, and he had this idea and theory about uh, group development and, and the stages that we go through to ultimately be the best that we can be. And what he said is that uh, we essentially start in the forming phase uh, where everybody's just coming together, getting to know each other, trying to figure out their strengths, everybody's strengths and their weaknesses. And then ultimately, at some point in time, there is a storming phase where people vie for positions and uh, just try to figure out where they fit in the overall team, uh, maybe power structure or just uh, you know, the, the atmosphere environment that exists. And then once that settles, we get into a norming phase and then a performing phase. And two things I want to hit on here is the first is that you have to realize that to get to, to become a high performing team, you have to be willing to go through the storming phase. And I think that's important because um, it's a useful model to, that should encourage you um, and hopefully motivate you to be willing to do that. Um, and so the first problem I see is that leaders don't usually have the courage to go into this phase of storm. And then the second issue I see is that once they get into that, some people who just love drama and love um, whatever that might be, I'm not even sure what they love. Usually it's just the drama aspect. Um, they're not sure how to get out of it. They don't have the wisdom to know how to have a crucial conversation effectively. And so to do this well requires two things. They have courage and they have wisdom to know how to get through uh, in a way that moves everybody forward and doesn't leave anybody behind. And so to do that, let's try to understand conflict quickly. Um, conflict takes us to a better place when it is done well. Um, we have to understand that none of us can get where we want to go alone. We all need each other uh, to, to, in an encouragement role, in an accountability role um, to, help us all, to help us be better. And when we think about exercise science, um, we know that you know, if I'm going to do take uh, six ounces and do bicep curls, that's not really putting tension on the muscle to grow. Um, if I were to pick up a hundred pound dumbbell and try to bicep curl, that would be too much and uh, could possibly, you know, tear the muscle itself. And so it's an interesting uh, visual that most people understand. It says that you do need some level of, of, of strain that's there on the muscle to improve and so some conflict is good and it's needed and it's required and too much though will ruin the team so it requires wisdom to know how to balance that. The second part of this is that alignment is better than agreement. You don't want a team that is full of yes men where everyone thinks alike, no one thinks very much, which is a great quote that I like. Um, and so when we think about uh, coming into conflicts, maybe it's about how we should the decisions that need to be made for the next game, or it could be a, a number of things. But when you're speaking to others and having this debate or this conflict, you want to think about are your goals aligned and is effort aligned as well? If you're debating that with somebody else and th that isn't there, um, then it's usually uh, not going to be very useful uh, discussion, so to speak, when it comes to conflict. When we think about thunderstorms versus a constant drizzle, um, I think it's a good visual for us. Um, and when you think about thunderstorm, you, you think of uh, you know, strong, heavy, even, uh, I don't wanna say violent, but um, there's, there should be no physical violence go happening usually, but uh, uh, you think about those things. It's just very quick and it's strong. And then in the morning, it comes in, you know, in a period of time that's usually very quick and then it goes away and the next day there's sun out. Um, and the rain that, that came and the, the thunderstorm and what it brought ultimately helps things to, to thrive. And that water and everything that came down is good. Um, but if you're in an area where there's just this constant uh, drizzle that's overarching um, you know, the environment uh, you get and it never goes away, uh, things get moldy and there's no real room for uh, flourishing and growth. And so that's a visual I try to communicate that helps you think about you know, don't, what happens if, if you're afraid and you don't address conflict, 
what can happen um, is it just lingers over the team for long periods of time and it's not good at all for, for anybody on the team and for anybody's improvement. Another thing too is uh, understanding this idea when we think about admonishments. Uh, admonishment is really when I say hold people accountable, I like this word better um, because admonishment has everything to do, uh, it's all about the other individual and, um, and, and, and realizing that it's not something you're doing to them, it's something you're doing for them. Um, admonishment is about advising and counseling. Uh, that is good-willed and it, that it is for them ultimately. Um, and it requires this prioritization that we talked about in session two, which is that the team is first, your teammate is second, and you at the bottom. Um, and ultimately, when we talk about conflict too, we have to think about grace versus truth, right? Sometimes we have to be gracious and understand that everybody's on their own journey um, and that there should be some grace that's given uh, under certain circumstances, but also realizing that truth has to be brought on to the table as well. And, and people need to be held accountable to certain standards and behaviors because ultimately it's about what's best for the team. And I love this quote at the bottom that summarizes this up well. We talked about in session two again how leadership is service, right? And, and going through these uncomfortable conversations can be really hard and difficult. But at the end of the day, if you can do this and do this well, you have developed a skill set um, that will be incredibly useful for you in your life. And Tim Ferriss says that a person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations that he or she is willing to have. And I think that's really a true statement. And finally, uh, the last model I have here, just for your awareness more so than anything, is this idea of what's it's called the drama triangle. Here they call it the empowerment triangle, but if you look at this, uh, the, the lighter shaded orange here, it has rescuer, persecutor, and victim. Um, a lot of times what, what will happen is uh, athletes within your program can, some of them might have this, this victim mentality. And essentially what we want to do is um, we want to help to move them to be more of a creator and that get, get them to understand that they can overcome uh, the challenges that they have. And usually within any type of drama, um, you have this victim, right? You have a, somebody who is persecuting that victim, and you have somebody else who is a rescuer or a hero that comes in and says, oh, poor you victim, and they act as a support for that victim. But what we wanna really be able to do um, is move from, is move the victim to become a creator, which is a, just a change in my mindset. And that's up to you to be able to influence them uh, to occur. And then from the hero or rescuer position, stop being someone who comes in and coddles and be someone that coaches. Um, a lot of times that requires you to just, uh, it's really a skill of listening and getting you to think about how you can help move them to be a creator. And then when it comes to being a persecutor, a lot of times individuals, uh, team captains that hold people accountable, that's the relationship that occurs is a persecutor versus victim. And so what we want to do is move from becoming a persecutor to a challenger. And really that takes some wisdom to figure out who that individual is and how we can make that approach, that crucial conversation more constructive. Um, and, and that is something that really, again, takes some wisdom, which I have other thoughts on if you're interested in understanding this more. There's uh, plenty of videos that are out there on this. Uh, and be, always feel free to reach out to me if you uh, have particular questions or situations you're not quite sure of how to um, overcome. And in conclusion, I think a couple things that I'd like to make sure we highlight is the first, that culture is powerful. And then many ways it has the power to shape reality. And our culture ultimately stems from what you allow, what your coach and what the US team captains allow within your program. When, it, when we think about crucial conversations, holding people accountable, you have to be willing to do that. 
and um, you know it's a requirement to this uh, this idea of culture and the behaviors and the standards of behaviors that are acceptable uh, because ultimately our process is our behaviors and our behaviors drive um, the results that we get over time and they put us in a certain position that gives us a certain probability of winning. Um, and finally, uh, in regards to this drama triangle that I mentioned, what we want to tr try to do is to get everybody out of this victim mentality and move them to become creators, um, which is a difficult process, but one that can happen. And just try to make sure that you stay out of this, the drama triangle and flip it uh, on its head, so to speak. And so I hope that this was useful for you. Again, this was session uh, three and um, we'll have session four in uh, the coming weeks. So I appreciate your time and hope that this was useful in helping you to lead your teams more effectively.